Hi, guys. Um, I guess one thing to start. I'm holding a microphone this time around. If I start doing this and you can't hear me, then make some hand gestures to say I put the mic back next to your face. Um, cool. Welcome to my conference talk. I am Holly Gressel, the author of this pink information security blog. You should all follow me on Twitter because it's how I judge myself as a person. No, seriously, I'll wait. OK, seriously, though. Um, I'm here to talk about offensive anti-analysis, which is a title that I made up because it sounds cool. Uh, a better name for it is probably Holly's Adventures in Antivirus Evasion Part 4. Um, this is an incoherent 45-minute rant about the antivirus community, so strap in for that. Um, I'm not a, a public speaker normally, so if I get a little bit lost about my slide deck, then don't worry about it, I'll work it out. But um, there's no demos in this one to go wrong, it's just slides of the content, so hopefully everything will work out just fine. But part four, that means content came before it. Part one was um, looking at antivirus evasion. It was different methods of evading antivirus. Part two was that time that I made an aquarium because my landlord tells me I'm not allowed pets. So my aquarium was a whole world of VM set up with different antivirus. And I'd fire viruses around the network and see what happens. Turns out that someone's already done this. It's called VirusTotal.com. And I was a little bit late to that party. So part three was that time that I hacked VirusTotal. And, or didn't, as the story may tell. And part four, where we're at now, is a little bit of a rant about the way that antivirus works, the way that the community works. And ultimately, my goal of the end of, to the end of this talk is setting up the world's most ironic botnet. So, um, starting at the beginning then, my last talk, I said, starting at the beginning, there's two types of antivirus. There's signature analysis and behavioral analysis. And, well, that's not strictly true, because there's this thing called next generation antivirus, and that sounds really cool. And that's the problem with information security, you see, because it sounds really cool. So, time to get angry. We've got this problem in information security where we keep militarizing everything, and there's some brilliant talks about reclaiming the word cyber, and we totally should. But when people use the word cyber in this kind of style, marketing material kind of style, then it really holds no meaning. So, I say next generation antivirus, and we have well, cyber zero days and things like that. Well, in the context of antivirus, these things don't really mean anything. And the problem with that is, Take a look at malicious software, malware. We have antiviral systems or anti-malware systems to fight the zero-day cyber malwares. And, well, they've been around for a little while. And you kind of think, if we were going to fix it, we'd have done it by now. I mean, malware is 30 years old. Ransomware, specifically, the first ransomware was 1989. That's older than me. Ransomware is literally a problem older than I am. And suddenly, 30 years in, we're up to next generation antivirus and it's going to fix all of the problems. Now, the problem with antivirus, really, as I see it, is, um, well, two sides. My B-sides talk, I ranted about defining malicious and how that's a problem. The other side of it, really, is we don't know how they work. You, you download antiviral software, you install it on your machine, and it keeps you safe, somehow. If you look at next-gen antivirus, they start using algorithms. So next-generation antivirus works. It's not signatures or behavior. It's algorithm-based. That'll keep us safe. I'm sure it will. Now, um, there's a problem around next-generation weaponized cyber zero days. And I think this comes from the movies, where people have seen that documentary Hackers, and they think, that's what it's like in real life. Now, in real life, in my day job, my 9 to 5, I'm a penetration tester. That's why I got into malicious software. I do malicious software development, not analysis, the bad kind, development. And I find it really fun. It gives me a benefit in my day job when I break into computers and buildings. Now, when people talk to me about this and they ask me questions about this, they have clearly seen CSI Cyber, and they clearly think they know how it works. So, uh, take a tangent. We'll talk about the part of my day job where I break into buildings. People ask me questions about this, and it's a nice analogy, because it's the same kind of problem. So yesterday, somebody asked me, what do I think is my most effective disguise when I'm doing a physical access assessment? Um, employee? What scenario do you build up before you break into a building? That I work there? Really, it's not, um, it's not these kind of chaps. I'm not going to put on a, a hat or those cool sunglasses and try and talk my way through an overdeveloped scenario. 
I don't walk up to reception and start the conversation about how I'm an engineer and, and I'm supposed to be there and someone will vouch for me, he's called Matt Honest. The way that I do it is I just walk around the office for a bit, probably steal some stuff, probably pl plug a Raspberry Pi into a computer. After all, I'm a hacker, but I don't look like a hacker, and that's my benefit. So, no, there is no big scenario. There is no disguises, I'm afraid. And physical access may or may not work how you think it does, in the same sense that antivirus may or may not work in the way that you think it does. But, as a penetration tester, that means I'm an ethical hacker. Sorry, that's a hacktivist. That's a hacker. Um, I'm an ethical hacker, which means I break into buildings and computers, I tell people how I do it, and a side effect of that is I really like malware. I really like malicious software. I think the problem of malicious software is something that's hung around for so long because it's a genuinely difficult problem, both in terms of how do we define malicious and how can we do detections if we don't understand malicious, and also in terms of the fact that there's an awful lot of competition in that market. There's a couple of reasons for that. We've got next generation antivirus and what they call their competition, which is legacy antivirus. And then we've also got things like them trying to protect their intellectual property. So they're not really going to disclose too much information about how their products work, potentially because they don't want the competition to steal those ideas. And the competition's pretty strong, pretty complex, and pretty weird, to be honest. So next generation antivirus, an example of that is Silence. You may or may not have heard of those. You've probably heard of Sophos, though, because they've been around for a long time. They fit into the legacy category. Now, Silence and Sophos, very recently, had a little bit of a uh, lover's tiff. And allegedly, Silence were, hmm, how did they put it? Well, choreographing demonstrations. So they were saying Silence versus Sophos. Here's a demo, Sophos didn't pick up anything, Silence picked up everything, therefore Silence is better and you should buy it. And Sophos responded with, well, staging a well-choreographed battle, of course you're going to win. And uh, allegedly, Silence disabled some required protections, some default protections in the Sophos antivirus, so when they put them head-to-head, -head, Silence had the advantage. Silence responded with, well, this has happened to us before. Legacy AV vendors have done demonstrations with our software that are purposely misleading. So we know that we need antivirus, or rather we know that we don't need viruses, malware. So we try and get some kind of protection mechanism, but they're black box protection systems. We install them and hope that they protect us. The antivirus companies themselves are saying that they're not because both sides of both arguments are misleading in some way or another, allegedly, so I don't get sued. Um, so, well, what are we to do? For silence say the only thing that we can do is to test the software ourselves. And everyone in this room is like, cool, yeah man, that sounds good. I'm a techie, I can do that. I'll download all of these softwares, I'll set up an aquarium like Holly did, and people will go, nice fish. However, Think about the companies that you work with in your day jobs, or think of the companies that you aspire to work with. A lot of them are less well kitted out to do these kinds of tests than others. We wouldn't have subject matter experts, we wouldn't pay for third party penetration testing if we could do everything in house. So if the burden of proof is on the user, are the users really kitted out to do these kinds of tests? Well, thankfully you don't have to, because Tavis Armandi has been working his way through the antivirus community and thoroughly pulling the pants down on every vendor that comes in front of him. The, the first one that he looked at, the aptly named Sofail, pause for drink, um, Sofail was uh, an analysis of the Sophos antivirus, and I'm not going to pick on Sophos, and in fact, Tavis didn't pick on Sophos either, and he's thoroughly pulled the pants down of lots of vendors over the, the period he's been looking at them. And he's taken a look at these systems, and he has found that not only are there vulnerabilities in the antivirus themselves, and that's a problem, because you install these systems to protect yourselves, he you found unauthenticated remote code execution at ring zero in Symantec. That's pretty bad. Found it in um, Sophos. That's pretty bad. Or rather, a buffer overflow in Sophos. That's pretty bad. So we install these softwares to add protections using terms like defense in depth, and really, potentially, we're adding vulnerabilities if the software is not well built. The antivirus community have responded to this, they fixed the vulnerabilities, or they put some marketing out there saying that they're working on it. The paper was cool, we all had a laugh in, uh, in the red team world. However, buried in things like the Sofail paper were other little details that no one really picked up on and the media didn't jump on because it's not ring zero remote code execution. 
and it's not weaponized exploits. One of the things he picked out in the Sofail paper was the fact that, in his opinion, his words, he didn't think that the Sophos researchers really understood the context that the code was executing under. And therefore, when they wrote signatures, it was often for unused or dead code. So they were just going like, oh, that'd make a nice signature. We'll write a signature for that, pick it up for that. And the antivirus writer can just go, oh, I'm not actually using that code. I can just delete it. Signature goes away. So antivirus, supposed to protect us, supposed to use algorithms and all kinds of cool stuff, doesn't necessarily protect us if it's introducing vulnerabilities. We don't know how it works, but when someone looks into it, it turns out it's not doing a particularly good job of it. So, as I said at the beginning, I set up the Aquarium project and then suddenly found out that someone's already done it before me. And there's these websites out there where you can send it an EXE and it'll scan them for you. So, there's lots of online scanners, scan nets out there. You send it an EXE payload, it'll run it for you and it'll tell you whether it's malicious. Probably the most well-known one is virus total, and the way that virus total works is two tabs. There's the antivirus scans, where it'll run 56 antivirus against the EXE, and then the behavioral tab, which is its own product that it'll run and tell you how the behavior works. Um, I took a look at a few of them. I'm not going to pick up on any one in particular. I'll probably talk more specifically at virus total, because from my last talk, I spoke to them and, and they responded to, to emails and things like that. However, two things that I'm going to look at doing today. One of them is um, what I did in my B-Sides talk, which is effectively a complete bypass of the scanner engine. And the other side of the things I'm going to do is, hey, if these are on the internet and I give it an EXE and it runs it, wouldn't it be incredibly ironic if I put malware on it? If you're setting up a botnet and you're setting up a a C2 command and control botnet, wouldn't it be really cool if you could put it on one of these? Just for the irony of when someone's like, oh my god, there's attack traffic coming in from virus toll. What? So, um, so the way that it works is give them an EXE, they scan it, they'll tell you if it's bad. So malware's really easy to work out if it's malware or not. You know, you upload probably malware.exe and it's like, yeah, this is definitely malware because when we ran it on our computer, that happened. Yeah, ransomware is pretty obvious. Ransomware is actually one of my favorite things to happen to the antivirus community because it makes users aware that malware is a problem. Users are just like, nah, man, we just install like whatever comes with Windows and we're probably fine. However, we should look at these antivirus systems and see, are they protecting us? Are they doing a good job? Ransomware is easy to work out because it does that to your desktop. Botnet uh, herders and things like that, they're a little bit more subtle. They can employ techniques to basically make it so you don't know if you're infected or not. But starting at the beginning of what I did to Virus Total and what I did to the other online scanners, I, I found a way in Virus Total that I could extract information from their system that would allow me to accurately fin fingerprint their scanning engine. And what that allowed me to do was write a piece of malware that knows what Virus Total looks like, and then it can choose not to be malicious when it's in that engine. So the behavioral engine's looking for malicious behavior, and the, the EXE is just like, oh, this is a scanner. I'll pretend to be good. Pretty simple. I contacted Google, and I was like, hey, Google kind of found a vulnerability, but it's a little bit weird to explain. I sent them a really, really long email that basically said, I can extract information from the system. I guess you would call it remote code execution, but it's by design. Of course it's by design. I give it an EXE, it runs it, that's the point of the product. It's probably not the point of the product for me to be able to extract information from it, or that was my opinion. So I said to them, what I'm thinking is I upload an EXE, and the attack scenario is that I can accurately fingerprint the behavioral engine and therefore avoid detection. And Google sent me a wordy email back. You'll never read that at the back, so I made it bigger and realized you'll still never read that. The only important part, if you minus out all the technical details, is the first and last line, which is, turns out this is working as intended. What you've reported so far isn't a security vulnerability. So we'll start there. We'll start with the fact that I can accurately fingerprint an antivirus engine and write a tool that not only tells me which antivirus engine I'm in, but can actively avoid it because it says this is a scanner, therefore I won't be malicious. We've seen attacks like this before. The Google Play Store had a little bit of a problem with malware because they were less strict than the iOS App Store in, in what kind of applications they allowed on. And they just allowed anyone on, so obviously the malware developers were like, wicked, we'll write loads of malware stick it on the Play Store. Now, Google introduced a system called Bouncer, and Bouncer was a behavioral analysis engine, and it scanned apps as they were uploaded. Excuse me. And if they did anything malicious, it removed them from the Play Store. So, to get onto the store, you had to pass that behavioral analysis engine. And it took researchers approximately five minutes to work out how to bypass that system. It was really trivial. 
you just don't do anything malicious whilst the scanner's running. The scanner only runs for five minutes, you just do sleep five minutes, do malicious stuff. And it's that kind of attack, that kind of attack that we're looking at here. So, apparently, I'm going to rant at you for the next 20 minutes about something that's not a vulnerability, but by the end of it, you'll be on my side. It will be a vulnerability, God damn it. So, starting at the beginning. Um, the ability to extract information from the scanner is apparently not a vulnerability. So why does the scanner try and prevent me from doing this? If I try and extract the username from the scanner, it'll replace what I extract with the word user in angle brackets. So it's picked up that I'm trying to steal some information and it's removing it. Now, when I spoke at the beginning about next generation weaponized cyber zero days, I wasn't complaining about the word cyber. I was complaining about our industry's requirement for everything to be cool, and we won't look at security unless it's cool. If it's not a zero day, I don't care about it. Problem with that is, um, especially in the area of antivirus, the evasions are naive. You don't need to put a lot of effort in. You don't need to write assembly and do crazy things like that. Academics are doing that because they have to justify PhDs. To justify a PhD, <laughs> wasn't expecting a laugh there. <laughs> to justify a PhD, you need to show a significant contribution to your field. And I'll never get a PhD for this research because what I do is really naive. And I'm trying to highlight the fact that you can get effective attacks against these systems doing really trivial stuff. So, academics are doing things like looking at hardware implementations of processors, finding a bug in the hardware implementation, and then comparing that to the software implementation, and if the bug isn't present, it must be a virtualized system. <coughs> Scanners are virtualized, therefore there's a chance that you're in a VM. Or if not a VM like VirusTotal, then potentially you're on a malware analyst's machine directly. Now, implementing bugs in code is a difficult thing, and in fact, finding the bugs in the first place is a difficult thing. It's a really cool technique for avoiding virtualization. I didn't need to do that. What I did was I extracted all of the information from VirusTotal about their scanner, and I'm talking like username, serial numbers, files on the desktop, stuff like that. I extracted all of those, and then just wrote a signature and said, if you see these files, you're on VirusTotal. Now, if you imagine, for example, if the running user is called VirusTotal, it's like, pretty obvious I'm being scanned right now. And it's that kind of technique that I'm doing. So I'm really sorry, I'm not going to drop any zero days. There's not going to be slides filled with assembly, because you don't need it. But I want to extract the username, and they won't let me. So I need to obfuscate the username in such a way that I can extract it without it realizing that it's the username. Now this could be something really cool. I could write my own encryption algorithm, and I could encrypt the payload. And then when I extract it, I can decrypt it client side. They'll never see that coming out. Or I can just like put a space between every letter, or reverse the string, or bear 64 it, or... And then suddenly, username isn't replaced by flagged user anymore, it's the actual username that comes out. The first implementation that I wrote, I bear 64 it, and I pulled it out, bear 64 I wrote Python script to decode it for me and everything. I had like a shell on VirusTotal that felt really cool. Still felt like too much effort, so instead I just wrote a payload that changes it, puts a full stop between every letter, and it comes out in the interface directly. So, what kinds of information was I flagging them on, and what kind of information do you need to, to look at to know that you're being scanned by these kinds of systems? Not, sp not thinking specifically virus total, but the kinds of scanners that I have seen online, the kind of ones I've talked about today. Username's a really good one, because the username is pretty unique. Another one is the services that are running. So, any malware analyst, in fact, there's an awful lot of blog content that, out there about using systems like VMware and about using VirtualBox and hardening them in such a way that malware can't tell it's virtualized. So stripping all of the little tokens out of the system in such a way that the malware won't be able to know that it's on VBox. They didn't bother with that. Just running process. Now, when I first started looking at the system and I, I was thinking about the things that I can do, it's like, right, I'll take a list of the running processes and see if there's virus total to exe on there, or see if there's anything like VBox on there, which is VirtualBox's process. And I'll pick up on those, and I'll say, right, to read running processes, you need to be an administrator. So I'll need to find a privilege escalation vulnerability, but I'll need to find it blindly, because I can't extract information at this point. And I did, I found a privilege escalation vulnerability, and it was awesome. And I exploited it, and I got a new admin account, and that was wicked. And I realized you're running as admin anyway, you've just wasted an entire weekend. <laughs> So, yeah, it turns out it's even more naive than I thought it was. So, 
Pull out the username, that's unique. Pull out the running processes, look for anything that looks like you're virtualized. This is actually a reduced list. There's a few more in there that I'll give you hints. But VBox Tray and VBox Service are a pretty good indicator that you're on VirtualBox. And then take a look around the system and see if there's any other artifacts, such as VirtualBox being installed, uh, VMware being installed, or guest additions. All of these things that academics have already fixed, and all of the malware analysts out there are probably crying right now, actually, but before they were crying, have written blog posts on how to harden these systems, and none of them are actually implemented. The existence of files is a good indicator that we're virtualized, especially if one of them's like C program files, virus total, or something like that. But also take a look on the, on the desktop, take a look in the documents, and see if there's unique files there. Take a look at the uptime of the system. I mean, you would think that these nodes, as you send an exe up, you think the node would be spun up, it'd scan the exe, it'd be spun down, so your uptime would be like seven seconds or something just inhumanly short. It's not, turns out it's like four years, no idea what's going on there. But it's another unique signature that we can pick up on. We can take a look at the, the scanning nodes, take a look at the uptime of them all and see if it matches. So, if I can flag on these things and I can extract this information, I can build it into my exe, and my exe can be built in such a way so that when it runs on my desktop, it uh, does the attack payload thing. And when it runs on virus total, it does something else. You can write cool tools like this, where whenever an IT admin scans a file to see if it's malicious, it gets what I want out of it. So I can lie to the admin. And that's really simple. And that's what I did at B-Sides, that's what I showed there. Where you run an executable and we can lie in the scanner output. So the behavioral tab, instead of showing what's actually happening, this is Mimikatz that's running, by the way. I wrote a, a wrapper that sits around Mimikatz and, and does this technique. Instead of running Mimikatz and being really obvious to the user, it'll just display any message that I want. So here's a social engineering moment where you can be like, totally not malware.txt. But now that I can do this, I thought, that's kind of awesome. I can weaponize this and release this as a cyber tool, and I'll get a conference talk, and everyone will clap. And that's cool. And the way that I extract this information, for anyone who knows these scanners, I did it through the front end, through the behavioral tab itself. You can pull the information out that way. And one of the things that I wanted to do whilst I was on their system was take a look at some of the file content. And that's really awkward because there's loads of it. So I thought of another, another way that I could extract information would be to just use raw socket calls. So instead of pulling out through the front end, I can effectively go out the back end. Now, you would think in this context that it would be strictly firewalled and they'd be filtering, you know, oh, what's that term? Data loss prevention. That's another, another cyber for you. Data loss prevention would prevent these kinds of attacks. And, well, yeah, you'd also think the uptime would be like seven seconds and we were wrong there. So getting it through the front end is pretty simple. Obfuscate the output, it comes straight out. Getting it through the back end, well, you can play around with it a little bit. Um, if I jump my slides forwards to this one, um, pulling it through the back end, you need to know work out what ports are open. So just write a payload that checks every port in turn. Can I get to a server that we control in every single port? If one of them's open, you can use that one. Try it in TCP, try it in UDP. Then you can try things like DNS tunneling. I'm going to go ahead and presume some people in the room are a little less penetration testing than other people. So Network sockets, we should all know those, just make a raw connection on TCP. DNS tunneling, the way that this works, if you're unfamiliar, is you do a lookup for a server that you control. So attacker.com, whatever website you have. But you'll put the payload, the information that you're trying to extract in the hostname as a subdomain. Then just check the logs of your DNS server. You'll see it ping. So DNS tunneling is a pretty simple way of doing it. We've got um, ICMP echo requests as well. That's one way of doing it. So ICMP echo request. Tunneling through a ping, basically, for those who are unfamiliar. You can read loads and loads of documentation on this kind of thing. And it's like, oh man, packets and stuff and bits. I don't understand any of this, but data, optional. That sounds good. Data, optional. So I can fit like 30 bytes of data into every ping packet, and then I can just ping my server, run Wireshark on my server, and every time a ping comes through, I can smuggle data in the back end of the ICMP echo request. That's pretty cool. Get 30 bytes at a time, which isn't a lot, but in fairness, you can send as many pings as you want. So, sneaking information out through the front end, sneaking information out through raw TCP sockets, smuggling it out through DNS and ICMP. The last one is UDP hole punching. UDP hole punching is a whole world of weird. Um, but basically, the way that UDP hole punching works is you have two servers behind NAT. So there's the virus total or other scanner that you're trying to target. And then there's your machine somewhere on the internet 
on your BT Home Hub connection, whatever you've got. And you just get the two systems to fire UDP traffic at each other. And you see, we have this thing, we have stateful firewalls. Stateful firewalls sound cool. And what they do is they track connections. So a TCP connection comes in, you see if it's authorized, and if it is, it allows it out. And then the return traffic comes back, and it's like, yep, that matches. This is a connection, this is allowed. Apart from UDP is a connectionless protocol. So the stateful firewall can't track connections because there aren't any. It's just traffic in each direction. So if you get your payload running on virus toll to just keep firing traffic at your home router, and you get a client on your home router to keep firing traffic at the target scanner, eventually the firewall will go, looks like these two things are trying to talk to each other. I'm going to let that through. And it just lets it through. So it sounds a little bit like magic, and there's a firewall engineer who works in my office who still doesn't believe me that this is possible. I didn't invent this. This is a thing that exists. And there's actually an implementation of it done by Sammy Kamkar, if anyone wants to look up a, just a working implementation of this kind of thing. Because that's the thing, you see. When we write malware, and we do these kinds of attacks, you'll see uh, malware anal analysis online, like Kaspersky Labs and people like that, pulling malware apart and being like, oh my god, this malware is terrible. It's written in the most naive of ways. It's just stolen code from all over the place. This is basically made from Stack Overflow. There's two things to say about that. The first is all software is made from Stack Overflow. If you want to have, if you want to see the most effective DOS attack in the world, take Stack Overflow down, and no work will get done. You'll probably write the economy off. That would be hilarious. Um, so all code is run from Stack Overflow and things like that. And when I, when I was taking a look at my B-Sides talks, and I'm sitting in the office, and I'm writing these packers, I don't want to write an implementation of AES, so I'm just going to go Stack Overflow, AES, download that, copy and paste into my malware send it up to the internet, and that totally works. I told a friend in the office about this, and he was like, no, this cannot possibly be true. And he downloaded an example ransomware from the internet, sent that to VirusTotal, it was like, yeah, this is definitely ransomware, I've seen this before, it's like encrypted my desktop and all sorts. And then he downloaded an example of the T encryption algorithm, wrapped the ransomware in that, fired that up, and got no hits. And he's like, wow. Um, Malware is copy-paste, and we're done. And yeah, it is. So we see all of these um, lab re reports coming out saying, this, this malware is trivial, and it was written from Stack Overflow. Don't concentrate on that. Don't concentrate on that point of view where we're like, if it doesn't include a zero day, it's not cool. Concentrate on, did they monetize it, and did they make a profit? So look at um, Crypto Wall, Crypto Locker, things like that. Allegedly, those two malwares made $3 million and $18 million each. That is crazy money. You could literally buy an island and hollow out a volcano, volcano for that kind of money. And then you see the analysis of it, and it's like, oh, this is really trivial, and this developer clearly doesn't have a clue what he's on about. Well, maybe we don't need to. So jumping back to where we were, if, if you take a look at systems like these online scanning engines, and you can upload a tool to them that'll fingerprint the fact that it's a scanning engine, You'll see that there's lots of different nodes on there, obviously, and for the sake of my own sanity, I named the node so I could work out what I was on, which node I was on. And, and then I tried lots of different techniques, TCP, UDP, UDP hole punching, all kinds of stuff to try and get traffic back from the scanner node to the internet. The reason that I was doing this was to exfiltrate data, but I had a little bit of a think. If you have this level of control over these scanning engines, and you know that you're in a scanning engine, and you can get to the internet, and you can communicate with servers on the internet, wouldn't that be the best place to put a command and control server for a botnet? Because you've got full control coming out of what the, de what the data is. So, yeah, when it comes to antivirus evasion, there's an awful lot of really cool work out there. The academics are doing some crazy stuff. But when it comes to actually what you need to do to pull an attack off, it's really naive. Take a look at the files that are up there. Taking a look at the way that traffic's filtered. It's probably not effectively filtered. You're writing proof of concepts like this, sending it into the vendors, and then the vendor's like, yeah, no, nah, we think this is all right, actually. Turns out this is working as intended. And I don't think it is, but I think the problem is wider than that one scanner that I was looking at. I think that the problem is our fixation as an information security community on things being cool. Start off at slide one, weaponize cyber zero days, take a look at slide 10, where we're like, yeah, man, I just copied and pasted some code. We've got wider problems in the community. So 
I'm really sorry for ranting at you for 30 minutes about what I did to virus total and totally not dropping any zero days, but I think that there's some problems with antivirus evasion stuff and I think we should fix it. And that's my rant over. Oh, questions? Go ahead. Yeah, so there's two ways to do that, and um, I saw a post somebody, uh, put, I think it was on Twitter in fact, they were like, why don't we just spin up loads of processes called like VBox and called like semantic.exe and stuff like that, and then malware will avoid that. And that's where we get into the problem of the arms race, where yeah, the malware totally would avoid that, this generation of malware would avoid it, and then the next generation will get better. So I think, yeah, I think we need to take a look at antivirus and be like, this isn't working. Just lying in demos is not the way to do it. We've got algorithms and next generation stuff coming out, and that sounds really cool. But yeah, maybe we should take the, the naivety and fire it back at the, the enemy. Anyone else? Oh, go ahead. I have a quick point about virus code. Mm -hmm. If you have some like sick malware that you don't want to get caught, don't upload it because they keep everything forever. So even though all the stuff on there is quite crap, and probably yeah. won't get caught first time around, if the signature turns up again and again, they'll look more closely and they will yeah. Um, so the point was uh, virus total keeps signatures, uh, keeps EXEs in their entirety and it will release them to people. Uh, yes it does, it will share them between antivirus vendors and also it holds onto them indefinitely. So Stuxnet was uploaded to virus total in like 2007 allegedly and no one paid any attention to it because no one knew what it was. But when it became interesting and we had fingerprints for its behaviour, somebody looked back through the API and was like, oh, that looks like Stuxnet, we can download it. So if you are a malware developer, please turn yourself into the police, they're just outside. Um, but yeah, if you are playing around with these techniques, do be aware of that. Um, there are systems out there that don't share samples, but still, I'm not going to help you with that because that's bad stuff. I am blue team. Although I'm a penetration tester, I do like defensive stuff. I'm highlighting problems so we can fix them. Anyone else? Got a question. Go ahead. Cool. So, the proposed fixes for the problems. No, it's not. Um, it's a really good um, question, actually, because you think the antivirus uh, community, the, the vendors would be looking at this, and I'm sure they are. A next generation antivirus has come out because the problem has been identified and we're trying to fix it. And they're using algorithms, so it's like, um, I don't know, throw AI and machine learning up in the air and catch what lands. And that's what they're going for. I think the naive stuff, we need to look at the work that's already been done and implement it. So the fact that I can um, fingerprint what the virtualization system is that the scanners are using, there's already fixes for that. Ask any malware analyst how they've set up their own system. It'll be hardened against those kinds of attacks. And maybe the scanners should be hardened too. Maybe just a little bit of code review. I don't know, follow Tavis or Mandy on Twitter, not me, because he rants an awful lot more about the way that legacy antivirus works and what we should do there. But basically, take a look at research that's already been done and implement it. One at the back. Because it breaks stuff. So uh, why isn't AppLocker and Emet rolled out wi uh, more widely? It's because it breaks stuff, that's the problem. How many, how many times have you worked with a company and the antivirus has pinged one too many times, so they've turned it off? False positives are really bad in the antivirus world. If your antivirus is loud, people will disable it. So that sucks. I'm really sorry, blame normal computer users, not me. <laughs> um, Emet's great though. Um, Emet and protections like AppLocker should be rolled out because they'll block things like ransomware. And although ransomware was first released in 1989, I don't think it became a massive problem until recently. I'd like to blame Bitcoin for that. The ability to monetize the attacks is, is what really made um, ransomware come about. And now that users are getting hit by it, or better yet, worse yet, ethical difficulties, the fact that hospitals are getting hit by it, now that it's actually causing a real-world impact, it's not just geeks who are concentrating on it, it's normal people who are looking into it. And I think that kind of thing will lead to a wider deployment of EMA and AppLocker. Two. Looking at you again. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, is it difficult then to, to 
try and hide the fact that you're in a virtual environment, like as the host of the environment, is it is it hard to try and mask that and make it look Yes, like very hard. Um, but um, just because the problem's hard doesn't mean we should avoid it. So um, the naive stuff's really easy. You don't have unique files on your machine. Don't have unique usernames. I mean, they're already scrambling the MAC addresses, for example. Every time the node comes up, it gets a unique MAC address. Those kinds of things are, are really easy to do. What's difficult to fix is what the academics are looking at. So things like um, causing, uh, finding bugs in VMware and VirtualBox that will cause crashes, for example. Finding bugs in the implementation, so um, VMware can talk to the host. You can share information between, not talking ESXi here, but talking VMware Workstation. You can talk to the host. So the malware can attempt to talk to the host, see if that connection's open. You can do things like um, seeing what BIOS features are available and try and communicate with those. If the system advertises a feature is available but you can't communicate to it, it's probably because it's lying and it's a virtualized environment. What I mentioned during the talk is um, bugs that exist in hardware, because hardware is unperfect, see if those exist in the software implementations. But those kinds of things, as hard as they are to fix, are also harder to write a tool that detects them. So with information security and with penetration testing kinds of things, a lot of the time we're just, we're just increasing the height of the speed bump. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. If we can take it away from naivety and make it a difficult problem, then that's good. So yes, sadly, a lot of these fixes are harder to implement, but we should totally do it. Oh, I've got two at the same time. Three. That one. <laughs> It's true, and um, publishing the techniques is, is a funny line that we have to draw as red teamers as well, because whenever we release a tool, it should benefit blue team more than it benefits red team. So if I come here and I do a talk about this is really easy and it shouldn't be easy, that's quite bad. But if I end at the, uh, the end of the day with, yeah, and here's a full proof of concept of how this works, then I've just slammed the, the speed bump right down. So you're absolutely right. We have to look at return on investment, but where we're at right now with a lot of these scanners, we need to be just a little bit higher. Do you have a question? Yeah. What's the concept of the, for the sort of files that users would actually be using on, on, on a system and look for behaviors that they've tried to use it and it's not there at first on a virtual machine? Yeah. Um, you need to look at what the botnet herders are not, not botnet herders, the other teams. You need to look at what the botnet trackers are doing. And one of the things the botnet trackers will do is they'll spin up a uh, virtual machine, infect it with malware on the hopes that it'll become a super node or become an important node in the botnet so that they can extract more information about the tracker. And they do things like that, like they'll set a wallpaper and they'll make messy files on the desktop and things. And they've got videos of the botnet herders logging in, having a poke around manually, a human taking a poke around the system to see if it's in use or not. And yeah, when you're at that level, we're really good. We're, we're really hard if you can't differentiate between if, is it a human or is it an analyst. But I think for the most part, the problem with saying, if this machine doesn't look like it's in use by a human, then I presume it's virtualized. The problem there is, how do you know if it's in use by a human? There's a few things you can look out for. Does it have a mouse and keyboard plugged in? Does it have a sound card, for example? Because all non-virtualized machines will have a sound card. But past that, in terms of things like mouse movements, idle time, things like that, it's really difficult. Well, I'm just thinking about, you know, file dates and times, what's in the temporary use of their files. Mm. File dates and times is, is uh, one that I looked at in this context, actually. Um, and like I say, the scanners that I was looking at, I naively presumed the uptime would be seconds because they'd just spin a node up and scan it. And it wasn't, it was years. And over the years, there had been file behavior. I don't know, maybe they're cloning the systems or something and there's, there's years worth of activity. But you're absolutely right. There's years worth of activity, but there's no activity in the last week, yeah. for example. Maybe wait until the next, yeah. next file write operation. Yeah. And, yeah. and those kinds of things would be really, really hard to defend against, but we're not there yet. Go ahead. Uh, you have a theory as to why Google would never bother to harden um, the virus talk scanners. It, it, it would seem that they would want to detect more advanced stuff. Yeah. Yeah, VirusTotal was written a long time ago. It was acquired by Google after. It is a Google product, but they didn't make it. 
Um, so a part of it is probably the fact that the tool was written an awful long time ago and it works. You know, this whole idea of we implement security after the fact, it might have just been that. And also, sometimes with vulnerabilities, I mean, we see it all the time, don't we? A new zero day will come out and everyone will panic. Heartbleed, for example. Wow, heartbleed, we need to patch in the next eight hours, otherwise the world's going to set on fire. And then someone looks and is like, guys, this has been here for like two years. I think it's one of those problems. If no one's really done this before, or if no one's done this and then talked about it, then maybe that's why they haven't fixed it. I think specifically why they say this isn't a security vulnerability in the emails where I'm talking about them is because the it's a language issue. So I think um, it isn't a security vulnerability because remote code execution is by design, but it is a risk to users because users use the system to see if something's malicious and I'm lying to the user. So I think we're just tripped up on terminology here. I'm not, I'm not saying like, oh, this is a security vulnerability and it's going to be like a patch to fix it. I'm saying it's kind of broken by design. Because every time I come up with a new way of obfuscating data and pulling it out of the system, you could say, oh, we could block that, or we could block that, or we could block that, and then we're back to the arms rest problem. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but where it is right now is pretty trivial. Oh, oh. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, just quickly. Um, yep. Do you think you might have more success with Google if you framed it as more of an information disclosure type bug? I did. I did. Um, so what I showed there was just the last paragraph where I talk about the attack scenario. The full email was huge. And it started out with an explanation of what I think the, the vulnerability is. And that's why I have the scenario. So I'm quite accurately defining the scenario. It's not code execution I'm talking about. It's data exfiltration. And I also gave them samples. Like, I can get this data, I can get that data out, things like that. Um, but yeah, I think the problem is, God, it's that bug bounty problem, isn't it? Where if you have a managed bug bounty, then do the guys who are, who are um, tracking it understand the issues? And if you have someone who does understand the issues, do they understand the terminology, the talking to people side of things? And it's a bit of a weird vulnerability that might be why it hasn't been addressed. Anyone else? No? Oh, go ahead. Um, uh, no, <laughs> don't try that. Um, no, you couldn't because this, this system is actually really small, which is why I talk about it as a, a C2, um, because it's, it's a really low powerful, low power machine, low bandwidth. Um, but yeah, God, that would be really weird, wouldn't it, if someone actually did that? Don't do that. Cool. Any more before we go? Go, right at the back. Um, it's not, it's kind of a similar subject, but so I work for information security for a financial services company. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a few recommendations now. Yeah. And we didn't think that really valuable to mess about something we can actually do with it. Yeah. <laughs> what, we're, and what we're trying to do is obviously reduce the attack surface, stop the guys over yeah. the kill chain. So we're just going to do just stop the power shop and we don't plug it. Did anyone hear the word kill chain then? Because I did. <laughs> so we just stopped normal users from being able to access the power shell. Yeah. So that's all good. But what, what could be the five things that we should be doing? Then we could things if you like. God. Oh, five whole things. I wish I had a slide for this. I absolutely can. And the way that I view red team engagements is based on how much effort I am going to put into them. So I'm a penetration tester. I break into computers for a living. I attack over the internet, which is probably, arguably, where most attacks come from. And I can do cyber zero day attacks and do SQL injection into your servers. But hopefully, because SQL injection came out in 1998, you fixed that. So the next one down I'll do from that in terms of effort level of the attacker is a phishing campaign. I do phishing campaigns all the time. I don't send an email to a user like, um, hey, what's your password? Because no one's going to fall for that. I send a, a subtle campaign with a link in. Generally, click this link. It'll prompt a login box. 50% of users click the link. 30% of users fill the login box in when I do these things. That's not Gartner statistics. That's just what I do at work. Um, if that doesn't work, if somehow you've managed to fix the phishing email problem, because I don't, I don't think anyone's fixed that yet, I'll just break into the building. Benefit of breaking into the building is I don't dress like a ninja, I don't wear a balaclava, and I don't own an anonymous mask. So people just let me in. I think in terms of quick wins from a cyber point of view, from a 
computer point of view is take a look at your monitoring and is it all on the perimeter? Because the perimeter doesn't necessarily exist anymore. So think of attack vectors like rubber duckies. It's 12 key presses to compromise a laptop if it's unencrypted. If I can either plug something in or get a user to plug something in, that's a massive threat. And the problem with that threat is it's a low difficulty to exploit. So stop, stop worrying so much about what nation state hackers can do and start worrying about what users can do to their own machines if someone gives them a USB. And also probably hire some armed guards. Probably. That was only one thing. You see how I got away with that? <laughs> yes, for five. Go ahead. Yeah, it's really context specific with VPNs because to me a VPN is just a tunnel. So if you're arbitrarily extending the perimeter, so say for example VPNing from a, a user's end device, then the problem gets really complex because the end device, is it a company device and you can lock that down, you can monitor it, you have your own endpoint protection on it, or is it a BYOD policy where the user's got their own machine? I think the problem doesn't get, doesn't change all that much. All you've done is geographically move the perimeter. If a user can still plug a USB device in, or if a user can still click a link on a phishing email, we've not really made any progress. So antivirus is, all right, the fact that antivirus only picks up 70% of the threats, is that what Symantec said? Something like that? 50%, oh God. It shouldn't be a problem. Shouldn't be a problem that antivirus only picks up 50% of the threats because our defensive technologies is not just antivirus, uh, antivirus systems. Antivirus isn't the front line, it's freaking one in front of HQ. They should have broken through so much stuff to get to that. The fact that a user can click a link or plug a USB device in or be coerced over the phone is a problem and your perimeter is nowhere near as deep as you think it is. I don't think the VPN issue is so much of a problem. VPNs stop me using Wireshark, that's it. I don't know any attacker that really uses that kind of technique. Unless you're in Starbucks and you're bored. And then VPNs are good. <laughs> Anyone else? Awesome. Okay. Thanks, guys. That was 45 minutes exactly.